Hi folks, welcome back to another vlog and welcome back to my channel. We are here in Cancun this afternoon. I have about a 24 hour layover here and I thought of vlogging this because I can spare an hour to do this sit down vlog that I haven't done in a while in which I will be answering most of your frequently asked questions from my previous vlog which was how i became a flight attendant i'll be posting a link down below and somewhere in here so that you're able to watch that video first and if you have some lingering questions then you're able to come back to this video and hopefully i'm able to answer some of those questions all of these questions i had hand picked from the comments from that vlog specifically so without further ado um, I think that's an intro in itself. So let's just get right into the video. Okay, so I have about 15 questions that I'm going to be answering as best as I can. So question one, the I think this is the most asked question from that vlog. Do you have to be a Canadian citizen? This is based on my observation and the stuff that I read online based on the requirements that most of the Canadian airlines have been um posting so with regards to your citizenship yes you do need to be either a canadian citizen or at least a permanent resident of canada for you to be able to apply now if you're living abroad per se i'm not sure if you're able to apply you gotta either have a pr or be a, per a canadian citizen i mean this is the thing being a Canadian citizen is one thing, but if you are a permanent resident of Canada, which means you're not holding a Canadian passport just yet, you also need to obtain visas to be able to fly to specific countries that that specific company operates in. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> so moving on to question two, um, let's see. Where or what is the best way to apply or how can I apply? Okay, so I think the best way to apply to a specific position or a flight attendant position is through obviously the company's website. I know when I had applied for the position, I either Googled and, you know, like Google will probably prompt you to all of these lists that are hiring, companies that are hiring, and each airline would probably have their own specific career page in their official website where you can kind of see all the um, like job postings and whatnot so i think that is the best way to apply do check out the airlines websites there's so much stuff in there that you can learn from or you can you know search up and whatnot to me that is the best way okay question three is there a physical test exam based on my experience alone i did have to do a physical some sort of physical exam after I passed my in-person interview so what they did to my application was I did the all of the interviews that I needed to do I had to do a first aid course and then I had to do a physical test and what I did was I did a bunch of lifting reach and you should be able to pass that for them to you know give you a go signal to do the next part of the hiring process in the company that I worked for number one is you must be able to lift 50 pounds from floor to waist and 22 pounds overhead the reason being is that if you become a flight attendant obviously there are some instances where you have to assist a passenger with lifting and you know pushing pulling even just pulling the carts is really heavy so you must be able to obviously pass and do that for you to be able to be fit for the job if anything and then the next big thing is you must be able to reach 204 centimeters without shoes and the ability to race on the balls of your feet so if i think this is what i did as well 204 centimeters barefoot this is again based on the specific aircraft that you will be trained on obviously if you're applying for a position where it specifically says you're gonna be doing a wide-bodied aircraft. It tends to have a higher overhead bin space, which will probably dramatically change the reach 
height, if anything. I'm only able to operate on the 737s and that's what they had required me to do. Moving on, we have question number four. Is there a height requirement? Okay, again, this ties to what I just had mentioned. When I had applied for the position, they never asked a specific height. We had to do the physical test, which includes the reach test of 204 centimeters. Depending on, again, the airline that you will be applying for, they must, you know, they may require you to be a certain height or um, they would just go for the reach test, the, uh, the reach test, which they had done in my case. Um, number five, is it okay if I wore glasses? Um, I can only speak for the company that I work for and as you can probably tell I wear glasses all the time you see me in vlogs all the time that I'm wearing glasses so there's not much of a problem with that specifically in the company that I work for some airlines might be stricter on this the best way is just to check out the the job posting they should be able to list down the requirements specifically for that specific airline do scars matter based on my observation i don't think scars matter again most airlines say in asia will be very very strict with the way you look your physical appearance your set of teeth your vision your tattoo scars and whatnot in the specific company that i worked for i don't think it's that big of a deal i've seen other fa's with a bit of a scar and it's totally fine if i'm being very opinionated it seems like it is a bit of a discrimination not to hire someone because of a certain scar that's just my take on it <laughs> okay how about tattoos again every airline is different depending on where the airline is with regards to rules and regulations some airlines might still prohibit showing huge tattoos or you know you still have to cover it up and whatnot recently the company that i worked for allowed showing tattoos to a certain size so i think it's the size of our id anything bigger than that i think you kind of still have to hide so no like no sleeve tattoos whatnot but we're getting there you know i'm glad that we're actually able to move a little bit forward and adapt to the changes be a little bit more modernized if anything because i don't have tattoos per se but i'm also kind of happy for the ones who do have tattoos and who don't have to hide them all the time now it's good that uh, the company they work for allows tattoos to be shown at a certain extent Maybe in the future, they will potentially allow a full sleeve shown to the public, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> okay, question eight. What is the age requirement or the maximum age, minimum age and whatnot? Okay, I always say a disclaimer because to be honest, really every single airline is different. Based on my observation, North American Airlines do not quite have a specific maximum age, if you will you do need to be a certain age to be able to apply so a minimum age of i think in canada would be 19. you can just search it up it's always going to be posted on the job posting for them the maximum age i don't think there is one because this is another touchy subject wherein if you put a maximum age to become a flight attendant then you're kind of discriminating based on age right so no age restriction but there is a minimum age of 19 or 21 or 18 i don't know for the us 19 years of age in canada for sure okay, question nine does marital status matter again another thing that most asian airlines have in their requirements for becoming a flight attendant not specifically popular in the north american countries um no i don't think it matters i've had FAs that I've worked with or FAs who I went to initial training with who are married, who are in their 50s, who are in their 20s and they're married and you know, it doesn't matter. So long as you're able to operate and you know, do your job, I don't think marital status, age matter. Question 10, do you need a college or university degree to be able to apply? Most airlines do not require for you to have a degree or a post-secondary education they only require at least a high school diploma 
Having said that, this particular industry is very, very competitive. When I say competitive, you get a lot of people trying to apply for the position who probably will have 20 years of customer service experience. They probably have some sort of post-secondary education or they may be a uh, ex-flight attendant from a different airline. So when I applied for the position, I was not a flight attendant before. I did have a post-secondary education in Vancouver, um, which was my choice because I wanted to finish and have a degree for me to be able to also explore my options and have a bigger opportunity in this industry that I so love. But that was my choice. I finished my university before even trying to apply. I do also have eight years of customer service experience, which I think those two were the biggest things that attracted the people hiring the HR management team when they saw my resume. So no, to some extent, education, degree, diploma would not really matter, but it could be an asset. I would really suggest, I would highly suggest, you know, some people ask me, stop me and ask me, hey, Michelle, do you have any, you know, tips for, you know, like people who wanted to apply to become a flight attendant, I always say, I always say that education could potentially be an asset, but gaining work experience, customer service experience especially, will be, you know, a really huge asset to the, like, the resume that you'll be sending, you'll be showing to the HR team. Okay, question 11. Do you need to speak French or other language? When I had applied for the position, they specifically asked for a bilingual cabin crew member. I was lucky that I am bilingual. I speak Filipino or Tagalog fluently, and one of the languages listed down there was Tagalog. So again, it depends on every airline. Another Canadian airline would only probably require for you to be able to speak French and English. Depending on the airline that you apply for, everything is different. Question 12, is accommodation covered during initial training or what is covered? When I had done my training, they covered my accommodation for the rest, for that whole four weeks of initial training. And yes, we got paid for those training. And I think we got per diem for that specific training. Back then, it was a d totally different story. Like if you were to be a flight attendant, it was so much harder back then because when you had applied for a flight attendant position, you're probably gonna be either on another, you know, different base, you have to commute there. You have to pay for your accommodation during initial. I'm not sure if it was paid for, you know, like your hours being on training. It's, we've come a long way. So when I had done my training, accommodation was paid for, shuttle to and from the campus, all covered. And we, ha we were paid for the hours that we were trained on um, eventually with all the per, per diems and whatnot, but yes. Is training paid? Okay, I've, I think I've already covered this. When we did our initial training, yes, we were paid for a certain amount of I, I can't quite remember, but we were paid to a certain extent of all the hours that we worked, all the e-learnings that we had done at home prior to even going to the initial training. Everything was paid for. I think we had to finish, we had to pass the, you know, we had to graduate or something before we were able to obtain that paycheck, our first kind of official paycheck. Question 14, can you please talk about salary. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to explain this as succinct as possible, but I'll I'll make it short and sweet and I'll I'll try my best. Okay, so flight attendants get paid differently. You know, you have a 9 9 to 5 hour job, you get paid per hour. Flight attendants, yes, at some like to some extent we get paid per hour. We have an hourly wage. So that's our kind of like our base pay hourly wage and for the company that I work for we we are given a certain amount of hours every month so our schedule comes on a specific 
day of the month and that's good for the next month so you kind of know your schedule for the rest of the month you can you know make arrangements plans and plan everything and whatnot but we get our schedules one month in advance for the rest of the month that covers the minimum hours that we are guaranteed so x amount of hours in that specific month times your hourly wage it will all depend on where you're sitting in the seniority how long have you been flying how long have you been been a flight attendant obviously if you're super senior your hourly wage will be good um, anyway so that specific hours in a month times your hourly wage if you end up picking up more flights more pairings and whatnot then obviously you'll be gaining more hours which you know that that whatever hours times your hourly wage that's kind of like our basic pay we also have what we call a per diem or meal allowance basically flight attendants always are away most of the time you'll go on a pairing right now i'm actually on a five day pairing today's day four of the five so i'm i'm away for a whole week and for this specific pairing alone we get a certain amount of per diems or meal allowance that's also going to be given on our paycheck that's going to cover most of you know like your food and other expenses that you might have during a layover if you can save your per diems by packing lunch packing dinner you know you'll save a lot more so most of the flight attendants pack their own you know breakfast lunch dinner whatever and then for a five day it is quite hard to pack i was only able to pack a th like good for three days and whatnot but today's day four and i'll be you know i'll have to purchase food at some point and day five so that's where the per diems come in and that's when it gets covered i'm sure if you're really into the airline industry you probably already know that flight attendants do not get paid for boarding for deplaning for that check-in that we have to do one hour before departure and when we do our pre-flight checks and whatnot it is not paid i don't know why but it's been like this forever one day i hope it changes but i hope i, I i'm able to explain it in a you know like a short and kind of like succinct summer summary of how our pay system works but the more you pick up the higher your paycheck is going to be if you pack your meals the better your paycheck will be because you're going to be saving all your per diems and the longer you're away from home will probably get you more per diems than having to do just a turn so that kind of like you know the multi-day pairings will probably appeal for the most like the junior fas because they're going to make more money out of being away from home for long periods of time yeah. okay the last question i have is how does your schedule work okay another kind of like a long process but so for the scheduling system as mentioned we are given a set of number of hours that's guaranteed in a month and then we can always just pick up or drop or trade um schedules or pairings if anything if i say pairing that's basically a set of a group um, flights segments of flights grouped in days and a pairing usually starts from your base and will always end in your base so let's use this example because i'm currently again on a five day pairing right now today's day four of five this is a one set of pairing we started our day one in vancouver we flew to edmonton we went back to vancouver and then we went back to edmonton we stayed the night in edmonton that was our day one day two we did edmonton to orlando and orlando back to edmonton then we ended our day in edmonton that was our day two day three which was yesterday we did edmonton to cancun cancun and then that was it so we had a we had to stay here in cancun for 24 hours and then later tonight we'll start our four day which is cancun to edmonton and we'll stay the night in edmonton tonight that's day four day five we will just be doing one leg edmonton back to vancouver and that's our day five that's the whole pairing if we say flight legs that's basically the segment or the sector so day one we did three legs so as mentioned we did vancouver edmonton edmonton vancouver vancouver edmonton that, that was three legs so 
a set of pairing could go from one day to five or six days, depending on how the schedule system works. I hope that kind of makes sense. Schedule-wise, we have a software where we can bid pretty much what we want, but that doesn't guarantee that we're going to be able to get them because with seniority bidding, this, the computer will probably read from top seniority all the way down. So you can bid, you know, the only good thing is that your your schedule will be very flexible. You can bid um, anything pretty much, you know, I want a reserve PM, I don't want AM, so I'm able to bid that put it in the whatever ranking you want you can bid for days off specific days off specific days off in between pairings so if i want two days in between two sets of pairings so that i am able to have a break in between i'm able to do that you can bid specific schedule like specific pairing so if i wanted this five day you are able to put it specifically there and just hope for the best that you're gonna get it based on seniority you're also able to bid generic layovers so if I want to bid just Cancun and any Cancun will do just bid there you're able to bid um, what do you call this you're able to bid check-in and check-out time so if you're not much of a morning person you can always just bid check-in at 2 p.m. so anything that anything before 2 p.m. you're gonna get rid of again based on seniority you can always bid just red eye pairings they can just you know whatever random red eyes if you're more of like a night owl is what I like about this job also is that the flexibility of it is amazing it's not a 9 to 5 job trust me I don't think I can ever go back to having a 9 to 5 job because even if I only get one day one day off in between pairings I'm still getting a different experience every single time and that's one of the things that I love about this job <laughs> but yeah that's pretty much a summary of how our schedules work anyway guys I think that is it for today's vlog I pretty much covered all 15 questions that I had picked from my previous vlog again we have that one vlog for you if you want to you know that's a 30 minute video of me trying to explain on how i became a flight attendant in canada and then this set of vlog is mostly me answering questions out of that vlog okay i'm gonna get ready now it's almost four o'clock in the afternoon here in cancun we will be leaving the hotel at around six o'clock or something like that i'm gonna get dressed get ready for work and yeah I hope you guys enjoyed this vlog and I hope you kind of learned a little bit more about the stuff that we do at this shop all the time if you enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up like subscribe hit the notification bell so you will get updated as soon as I have uploaded a video I'm gonna enjoy a little bit more sunshine and then get back to preparing for work have a good day